Good evening everybody and welcome to this uh, Facebook Live broadcast of a nightjar walk out on Wisley Common, Ockham and Chatley Heaths. Um, this is a site that is a lowland heathland habitat uh, located in the intersection between the A3 and the M25 at Junction 10. Um, and there are probably thousands of people that drive past this site on the M25 or the A3 on a daily basis without knowing some of the natural treasures that are hidden behind the tree line as they pass this site. So you can see behind me over my shoulder here, if I take a step to one side, this site is typically a lowland heathland habitat. Um, it's a site that, as the clues in the name, it's dominated by heathers um, in the dry and the wet areas. We've just got a woodcock roading off over the distance there. Um, I'll try and pick these things out as we go along with the, with the calls uh, and try and catch them on, on film as we do it, but we're filming off the phone. Um, and there's a nightjar cheering now. Short little burst. So that's the second cheer I've heard. And please do say in the comments if you're able to, to pick up the cheering because it was quite faint and quite distant that. And we'll get onto that in a minute. But as I was saying, Wisley and Ockham Commons is a lowland heathland habitat um, dominated by heathland plants, heathers, but also some young scrub uh, like gorses, um, some silver birch scrub. You can see there's a bit of bracken cover behind me here as well. And the tree line off in the distance here is a mixture of predominantly Scots pines, uh, but also um, uh, some mature silver birches, some oaks. Uh, how well has it recovered from the fires last summer? Um, Wisley didn't, to my knowledge, have a fire last year, and if it did, it was very, very small. Um, the site you might be thinking of is Chobham Common, uh, which is recovering re really well. Uh, a few people commenting saying they, they were able to hear the cheer of the nightjar there, which is fantastic um, because I'm relying on the, the phone technology here to uh, to pick up that cheer. So at this time of night, as dusk settles, the nightjars, the males in particular, start to become active. Um, same as any other, uh, I guess, type of bird. They have a call, which is known as a cheer. Uh, which is used by the males to help hold down their territory, deter other males, um, no problem it is, absolutely fine. Um, so they have this cheering call, they emit a, a, a note around one, sorry, 30 to 40 per second, um, and it's this cheering or jarring call uh, that is their song, essentially. Now they use that as their display, their vocal display, to hold down their territory, and also try and attract females to their territories in the same way that uh, you know a blackbird will sing from a perch uh, to mark its territory, show them the females that they're fit, they're strong, they're able to raise a brood, they've got access to good resources, uh, and uh, they can they can raise a brood. The nightjar, although it breeds in the UK, is a is an international bird. Really, this is the bird that um, comes to the UK for the summer. Uh, just a breed and the reason why I'm flapping around is because there's midges everywhere so apologies for that. Um, David, Thursley was uh, one of the sites also that had a big fire um, and Barossa uh, uh, is a site that has had fires this year as well so our heathlands do suffer from a bit of um, wildfire damage which is um, absolutely atrocious because the uh, wildlife that can get caught up in that uh, is um, yeah it's a sad loss but thankfully um, the sites do tend to recover really, really well. Um, but yeah, going back to the nightjar, these are a bird that migrate from sub-Saharan Africa. They spend the uh, our winters there, where they have access to uh, good food resources, a, a climate that's pleasant as, a, as opposed to ours in the winter months. And then around sort of April time, they'll start making the migration back up through the north of Africa, through southern Europe, and into Western Europe to uh, to breed on um, our lowland heathlands essentially, but also in clearings in woodlands, um, coniferous woodlands, that kind of thing. So it's a bird that we think of as a summer migrant to the UK because that's what it is, but it's a bird that's that we kind of share uh, with Southern Europe, Northern Africa, and, and areas around the Sub-Saharan as well. It's a bird that's got a wingspan of about 60 centimetres, um, so probably a bird that's a bit larger than most, most people think, but very, very long, thin wings, absolutely silent flight, um, and is a nocturnal bird. It becomes active at, at, uh, at dusk, uh, when, as I say, the males will start cheering to, to reaffirm their, um, their territory, to reaffirm any sort of bonds with their mate, uh, and to hold down um, the relationship with the female, um, make sure that they're protecting the nest, and then they'll go off and start feeding. Um, Okay, do they only cheer during breeding? That is a good question because I've never seen European nightjar uh, in 
Africa. So I'm presuming that they don't cheer over there because they don't necessarily have to hold down a breeding territory there because they only breed uh, up here in Europe. So I'm presuming not, but that's a very good question. Um, and strikes me as an opportunity to go to Africa to try and see if they see whether they cheer there or not, but I would guess not. Um, so, oh, and there's a quick call from a bird. The quick call is a contact call by the birds when they're on flight. So they will cheer when they're perched in a tree and then they'll make a quick call uh, when they're on the wing, which is very often sort of a contact call with the female or, or indeed with another with another nightjar um, when they're on the wing. I'll take us around the site a little bit, um, but also um, potentially come back to this spot because um, I came out and did a survey earlier and back end of last week, sorry, and there were two males uh, cheering around here. Uh, Emma, your question, let me just scroll back, was do they nest on the ground? Sorry about your ignorance. Emma, absolutely no no problem, uh, not ignorant at all. There's no such thing as a daft question. And yes, they do nest on the ground. Their markings are very cryptic um, and they blend in absolutely seamlessly um, with any of the leaf litter and the foliage that's on the floor on the heathlands or in a, in a clearing in a, in a woodland. So they just rely on their camouflage. They will literally pick a spot on the floor, very often next to some vegetation, like a, a small bit of heather or a young um, birch tree, for example. And they will nest there on the ground. They won't even gather in any materials. They'll just pick a spot, make a little um, scrape, if you like, a little clearing on that, and then um, they'll bring up their nest there. They'll have potentially two broods while they're here for the summer, um, and a clutch will be anywhere between one to three eggs, so the, the, the typical clutch size is, is two. Um, and then once they've done breeding, having arrived here in sort of early May time, they'll disappear, start making their way back to sub-Saharan Africa, anywhere from late August through to late September, depending on what happens with the weather and the wind direction, essentially. Um, a nocturnal bird, so fairly big eyes relative to the size of the bird. Um, feed on insects, so they're welcome to as many of these midges that are flying around me as they can possibly get hold of. Um, but they'll particularly feed on moths and, and beetles that are on the wing during the evening, so slightly larger invertebrate prey items. And they've got this huge, huge mouth, a, a really large gape even on the adult bird that helps them when they're flying around in the dark to catch these difficult to catch prey items um, that despite the big mouth and despite the big eyes that enable them to see quite well in the dark, um, all of these factors have evolved to help them be more successful wh when they're hunting. Um, right, Paul, are we likely to see any ado with a picture one? I'm doing this on a phone. If the light is good and birds take to the wings soon, um, I'll try and capture, capture them on the phone in flight. Um, we should get silhouettes of them in flight. Um, but if you jump on Surrey Wildlife Trust's website, there's loads of images there uh, of, of what night jars look like, or just Google European night jar, and you'll have hundreds of images to pick from. Um, Helena, second broods. Yes, they do have a second brood if they get here early enough and the weather conditions are favourable, there's enough food, etc. Um, they, they have been known to have second broods. So a pair could raise anywhere between two and six chicks per uh, season if they were successful in raising all of the young um, that, that they'd um, laid eggs for. Uh, where is, no worries at all Paul, where is this please use your spot and visit my father? Green and Common in Berkshire. Yep, so um, Vicky, that's absolutely true. That is a, another really good site for them. We're on Wisley and Ockham Commons in Surrey. As I was saying earlier, it's where the um, A3 intersects the uh, M25. Sorry, I was just turning around because I thought I heard a um, uh, woodcock flying behind me. Um, and, uh, oh, I've lost my train of thought now. Yep, it's gone, so we'll start again. So they will have uh, uh, a couple of broods per season. They'll fly back to sub-Saharan Africa uh, for the winter around late August through to late September. And there are hundreds of midges flying around. They're even on the phone. So I'll just flick him off the camera in case he, he arrives there. Uh, Simon, live in Farnham. Where's the best site nearby? Farnham Heath, which is run by the RSPB, is probably your best site there. Um, David always look forward to seeing him every year. Yeah, there's nothing like a nightjar in the UK. Nothing else sounds like it. Um, it's the only species of nightjar that we get in the UK. So there is nothing else like it that you'll experience in, in the UK. Um, and it's what I love about it is you don't have to travel hundreds of miles up to Scotland or to the middle of nowhere in central Wales uh, or, you know, make a long trek potentially to East Anglia and things to go and see some of these rare and exciting birds. They're right here in between Heathrow 
in that direction, Gatwick Airport in that direction, two of the busiest airports um, in the world, uh, certainly was with regards to Heathrow. And right next door to the M25 and the A3, two of the busiest road networks in the UK, and the M25 probably one of the busiest road networks in Europe. Uh, and I'm about to, sne to sneeze. Uh, Jamie out watching night jazz in a nearby spot. It's absolutely right there. They're all over our heathlands, luckily, in Surrey, and we're, we're a real hot spot for them. Um, in terms of numbers, the way we record night jars in the UK, because they're a very difficult bird to spot at night, with it being dark and then being nocturnal, it's very difficult to assess whether the birds have successfully paired up or not, and whether they're actually on, on eggs and are indeed um, on a brood of young. So the way we record this is by um, recording the number of cheering males. So when I'm out here doing a survey, I will um, walk around the site and make a note of where I've heard males cheering and when. I'll then go back and look at my notes afterwards on a, on a map to see whether I think that some of the cheers could have been the same bird that had just moved locations potentially. And you err on the side of caution and go with the, 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 the lowest positive number that you believe you have so say for example if i i've definitely heard two separate birds cheering at the same time i know there's two birds here if i heard a third a minute or two later in a close proximity to where i heard one of the previous birds i will probably say that's definitely two birds two separate males cheering and i won't call it a third um, because then you can be certain that you've got the the minimum number and the situation might just be a bit more positive than that if you've got it wrong in the UK, we will have around about four and a half thousand cheering males in any one year. So um, I've recorded three cheering males on this side of Wisley and Ockham Commons. Uh, last year on the other side of the common, on the other side of the A3, and there's a midge just gone in my ear. Um, I had, I think it was 10 cheering males, um, which is a really, really good number for the size of the heath that we're talking about. Um, they also, when they're feeding, um, with this massive, massive mouth part, they have essentially a bit like our eyelashes that come up a bit like whiskers from either side of their mouth. So this is a terrible impression, but if you imagine my mouth is a, is a nightjar's mouth, they have these hairs, stiff hairs, that stick up on either side of their, um, their gape on the jaw. And then that acts a bit like a second layer of um, defence, if you like, uh, that allows them to, if they don't quite catch hold of their prey item with their mouth, then these hairs kind of catch that prey item and they can sort of turn their head around to, to get a better grip of that prey item. So it decreases the risk of them losing prey items essentially and allows them to hunt a bit more successfully. Um, what else do I need to let you know? The average lifespan. Um, average lifespan of a night jar, uh, ringing efforts have shown that their average lifespan is around about four years in the wild. So this is a bird that will potentially be born in the UK, will then fly to Africa and back um, on average four times. So it does that, that Africa and back journey four times. So a journey of thousands of miles in their lifetime, let alone the, the journeys they make on the wing when they're here feeding and also when they're in sub-Saharan Africa feeding as well. But the oldest um, ringing recovery of a, of a wild night jar was a bird that was actually 12 years old. So they can be quite a long-lived bird um, relative to, to wild birds. So provided conditions are, are right and they get a good rub of the green, um, they can be a bird that can live way past that, uh, that four-year average lifespan. Now, we should be coming up at 29 past nine, about 10 minutes away if last week's anything to go by, from our first bird cheering. Um, we have heard a couple of faint little cheering calls off in the distance, Oi, little midges, in the distance that way. And we've heard one, there was a second one, which I think was over that direction. Um, and I've got a lengthy comment that I can't really see here. So Louise has said, can you describe what the nests look like? I think I've seen one in the woods near Cranley, but it was right at the edge of a car park, so maybe unlikely. Uh, Louise, yeah, probably unlikely because they're a bird that is um, heavily influenced by disturbance. And we've got a nightjar cheering. Is he off in the distance again there? Yeah. So again, you guys might have heard that cheer way off in the distance behind the camera. I'm just staying silent for a second, see if I can hear it. stopped at the minute um so yes louise the the nest <clears throat> if i'm honest <clears throat> whenever i've seen a nightjar nest it, it doesn't really look like anything 
Um, it is literally a patch on the floor that they've decided to lay their eggs on. So it's not like they gather nesting materials in, they don't inter interweave twigs and feathers and that kind of thing. Um, it, it's not a nest in the typical sense that we think of a bird's nest to be. It is just a patch on the ground that they have deemed suitable. Um, and they'll, they'll lay their eggs directly on the leaf litter and any foliage litter that's, that's there. There's a woodcock rodent somewhere. Oh, there he is, way off in the distance, way, way off. So the woodcock makes this really high-pitched, you might have got it then, high-pitched thin call, like a pss, pss. And that's the woodcock, here he goes, just coming around there. There, you might have heard that. Oh, and that might be a nightjar on the wing there, let me flip the camera around. Uh, that one. So there is a bird just through the undergrowth over that way that was on the wing. Now, was that a nightjar on the wing? Was that a nightjar on the wing? No? Oh, it was a woodcock, was it? Okay. Um, sorry, there's a few members of the public here with me helping helping me keep an eye out for uh, for any info, uh, sort of any birds that are on the wing because um, got quite a job on my hands here with technology in front of me 125 people watching live trying to talk about the night jars and spot them at the same time using and capture it on film using an iphone so my hands are full um let me just scroll back through a few comments so that nest was unlikely to be by the car park because as i was going to say they're a bird that is very susceptible to disturbance and that's why we ask um people when they're on the heaths during the summer months to keep, keep to the paths particularly dog owners and i'm a dog owner myself we ask them to keep their dogs under control on the paths and in sight at all times because it won't take a lot of disturbance for a nightjar to give up on the nest. Um, and these are a bird that have flown all the way from sub-Saharan Africa just to breed in the UK uh, and raise, you know, a, a very, very small number of chicks, anywhere between one and six if they're really lucky and they have a, a second brood and a big clutch both times. So we really need to do all we can on these spaces that are reserved for nature, hence the name Nature Reserve, to make sure that we we, we, we uh, give the birds the space and the privacy that they need, stick to the paths uh, and keep disturbance down to a minimum. Um, and there was another question, sorry, there's a few coming in. What's their main predator? Uh, which was from Lizzie. Now that is a really good question, Lizzie. Um, main predator of a nightjar? They probably don't have many because of the, the time, the, because they're nocturnal, essentially. They use the cover of darkness to, to act as a uh, layer of protection, basically. Um, so owls won't go hunting them. Um, I have seen Hobby out on the heath in the evenings hunting bats. But Hobby's relative to the size of a nightjar are quite a small bird of prey to try and take down a nightjar. So I think it's probably unlikely, um, although I would never say never when it comes to the natural world if a hobby was hungry enough uh, and desperate enough maybe they would and potentially they would take a juvenile nightjar perhaps uh, if the opportunity presented itself but they they probably don't have many um avian predators um richard's put the absolutely correct answer on their humans and their dogs is is um uh well certainly their dogs uh, is something that will cause an issue um how many dogs would actually eat a nightjar chick I'm, I'm not sure some probably would but disturbance is the real factor there um badgers if they came across a nightjar nest would, would take the eggs foxes would obviously take them so so some of our larger ground predators would take them uh, and equally grass snakes adders they would they will take a chick if they get a chance um they can physically overpower a, a young chick so they, they do have um yeah foxes absolutely um as i said foxes badgers grass snakes adders um probably the main predators corvids um if they come across a fox nest you know um carrion crows or uh, ravens will uh, will take them if they um oof, if they if they come across a nest but that's where they will lie on this camouflage uh, to keep the nest really well hidden so i'll just give you guys a little pan around to show you the type of habitat we're on because we're coming up to the point where the light levels are getting just about right on on the camera uh, this will make the light levels look a little bit lighter, which for me filming is a is a fantastic thing. Um, uh, a rats a problem. That's a good question. Um, we're bound to have rats on our on our heaths. Um, 
although uh, I actually live on one of our heaths and I haven't had any rat issues in and around my house now that's not to say they're not here um, because of course they will be so yes they will they will predate them if they come across them but rats aren't to my knowledge and I've been working on heathlands for for about 12 years now aren't a significant um, significantly abundant small mammal uh, on our heaths. I, I've never really seen them, haven't heard any records of significant populations on our heaths, although they're undoubtedly going to be here and yes they will be a predator. I don't think they're a significant impact on uh, on, on night jars. So let me flip the camera around and I'll just give you a pan around of, of the heath that we're on. There we go. So it's enough of my uh, enough of my face for five minutes. So this pine tree we've got here, this dead pine tree, the night jars will like perching up in some of these lower to middle tier branches here uh, and cheering on those branches and we'll get onto the core so if you sweep across you can see there's a lot of a lot of pine off in the distance all these lighter colored uh, plants sorry are our heathers these these ones in the foreground here this very vivid green is um the bracken these are some scots pines you've got silver birch which is the white tree there you can see from the path how sandy the soils are here that's very typical of our heathlands they like these nutrient poor uh, sandy soils and then sweeping around nice big open expanse of lowland heathland for the birds to nest on and we might just catch the end of the sunset there we go so that view is basically me the sunset you 119 people now watching and what's probably tens of thousands of midges if the uh, nibbles on my face are anything to go by oh no we've actually got a bat you won't be able to see it but there's a bat hunting just over the tree line here that i can see uh, and apologies I've, I've got the phone which is recording this but um there's no telephoto capability or anything like that on it. So as great as smartphones are, that I'm able to transport you to... Oh, sorry, just caught that in my foot. I'm able to transport you to Wisley and Ockham Commons tonight whilst you're in the comfort of your own homes. Uh, sadly, I can't quite zoom in to the level where I can, I can catch a bat on the wing on the phone. The noise you can hear, I'll flip the camera around a sec. That noise you can hear in the background, that's the A3. Um, so that gives you a bit of an indication how close, you can probably hear it in the background on the audio, I would have thought on this um, recording. And that gives you an idea of how close we are to um, a, a, a major UK road network. Uh, like I say, thousands of people travel past this site on a daily basis. Um, and uh, probably the vast majority don't even know this place is here. I'm just going to zip the fleece up to stop the midges getting down the top there. Um, any other bird song you can pick out? Right, let's have a listen. You can hear a robin way off in the distance. There was a song thrush singing earlier as well with a, a repetitive call. They, They'll very often repeat the same phrase two, three, four times over and then move to a, the next phrase that they're going to repeat. That's a song thrush behind me. Repeating the same call. Yeah, constant drone of the A3, yeah. I have to admit, during lockdown, the first one, it was a buzz. There's a woodcock on the wing somewhere. Just heard a call. Let's flip this round. There we go. You can hear that high pitched peep. Here he goes. Where is he? Oh, back over here. Sorry. So do do let me know if you could hear that high pitched peep or thin whistle call of the uh, of the woodcock. They're a bird that will road around. So they basically hug this tree line, and I've seen them roading all the way around. They just sort of hug the tree line of the open heath here, and they treat this all as one big amphitheatre 
and then they'll circle back around and start roading around the tree line again now you're n probably n well not never but hardly ever going to see a, a woodcock in the daytime they'll rest up on the floor in wet woodland oh Susanna you could hear it brilliant absolutely brilliant so for me as someone who's been out surveying night jars for quite a few years Paul superb so glad you guys heard it because that to me is the uh, the starter of the meal that is uh, taking in uh, uh, night jar surveying that's the little uh, there's a chair he's off that way somewhere So there was a faint call of a night jar off in the distance there. He's stopped now. There's another woodcock on the wing somewhere. And he's cheering again. Now, this is the point in the evening where things could go a bit manic. Um, we, once one night jar starts cheering at around about this time of night, and he's still cheering as the light levels are dropping, once one gets going, that will very often kick off another male to get going because they'll start to establish their territories again or re-establish their territories again for the night. Try and attract a female if they haven't got one already. He's still cheering. Uh, please do comment, guys. You, you, oh, Kirsty, you heard it. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Well, fingers crossed we should get louder calls. Um, I'm not going to move for the time being. I'm going to hold my position because I don't want to unnecessarily disturb these birds. They've come a hell of a long way to have a couple of broods. And if the wind picks up a bit, I'll try and um, block any wind baffle as well. Um, but very often when I've been night jar surveying, sur uh, surveying sorry, um, you would very often, if you just pick one spot, you will you will hear um, the night jars cheering. They will very often come to you, as is the way with a lot of wildlife watching. Um, why is it called cheering? That is a that is a really interesting call. I think. Sorry, just thought I heard a bird on the on the wing. Um, it's a really good question. I'm not 100 percent sure. So. The, part of it, I think, is because, yeah, Emma's made a good point. It does sound like, which is kind of like it's an awful impression of a night jar. Sorry to any night jars that were listening. Um, but it does kind of sound like when they're calling. Um, and also, some people have described the, the jar of night jar as the jar being the call. So, like, jar being the call. Again, horrific impression. I'm so sorry about that but that's a a, a, a a poor way of explaining the possible behind it um the other interesting little tidbit of information uh to do with the night jar is there uh, not too bad david very flattering thank you although i'm sure the night jars would disagree i'm very much not fluent in uh, in night jar um their latin name caprimulgus europaeus so the second half of the the latin name europaeus means european hence why it's a european night jar but the first part of the Latin, uh, Caprimulgus, this is where they get this mythical name of goat sucker or milk drinker from. Um, and this is because Capri from Caprimulgus, the Capri bit uh, in Latin means goat, essentially the same as Capricorn. And Mulgus is from the Latin Mulga, which is to, dr to drink or to, mil to milk, essentially. So this comes from the fact that many moons ago people believed that they they often saw the night jars when they were out shepherding their animals moving them around at dusk <clears throat> excuse me and they would see lots of night jars uh when they were moving their their animals around when they're moving their herds of goats or maybe even sheep around and that led people to believe that the night jars were turning up to steal the milk from the goats uh, because that's the only time they ever really saw them it's not true, obviously. They feed on invertebrates on the wing. They do not do anything to do with um, drinking the, the milk of any form of livestock. 
And what was probably happening was the movement and the action of the livestock in the evening as they settled down for bed was kicking up a lot of invertebrates from the foliage and the vegetation that those, that livestock was, was in and amongst, which meant that the night jars were treating the movement of those animals as an opportunity to have a really good buffet in the evening, their, their breakfast essentially, and they could get a really good hit of food and energy at the start of their night shift, for want of a better phrase. Um, and they could, um, they could either feed up themselves or get loads of prey items to take back to the nest to feed their young. So um, the Caprimulgus bit, goat, drink, uh, goat milk drinker, um, is, uh, is a slight um, mythical name uh, that they've picked up, but uh, I do quite like the story behind it. So that's obviously a, a fun little fact to drop in there. Uh, a Jamal, there is a lot of strange folklore out there. There's some other crackers. If you want to, if you want to get some funny names for animals, I'm sorry there are midges everywhere. Apologies for that. Um, you just need to look at the names of some moth species uh, and some other bits of folklore that exist. Um, elephant hawk moth is a good one. Bright pink and uh, lime green sort of hawk moth. Um, stunning moth to look at. People think it's from the tropics or something before they realise it's a, a UK species. But elephant hawk moth because the caterpillar looks like the trunk of an elephant. Uh, nothing to do with the moth. Um, but most of the time people only ever see the moth. So. There's some funny little names out there, but it does help all this stuff, for me at least, stick in my head a little bit. Um, right, I'm going to just move down the way a little bit here. Oh, and there's a bat buzzing around here. Sitting in the home with the windows closed and you're making me itch. <laughs> I know, sorry. I'm itching a little bit too, which is why I'm going to take you guys for a little walk down the way here just to see what we can pick up because they'll start cheering now I will leave you in peace but I might see you soon right here we go okay so I'll try and pick up the side of the heath here oh and there's a bat on the wing I'll flip the camera around as we're walking see if you can see this bat boom me a sick so that is my view at the moment. If I get less of the sky in, it might brighten up the, the scene for you a bit. So you can see very sandy soils. We've got a beautiful sunset here in Surrey tonight. Um, Avon skin, so soft, dry oil, excellent as mid repellent citronella, six quid on Amazon. Well, Vanda, I tell you what, you may have just changed a man's life there. You may have just changed a man's life because I am yet to find anything that uh, stops me being a all-you-can-eat buffet for midges. So uh, that Avon skin so soft might be the ticket. Have I got some white hankies? Karen, that's a really good point. And funny enough, yes, I do. Um, and the point Karen makes about the hankies, let me flip this round. Another night drive cheering way off in the distance. We'll get one on camera soon, I'm sure. Um, oh, there's one chewing. One faint little burst. They're giving us short bursts this evening. The point about the white hanky, so the males, at their wingtips and on the, the corners of their tail feathers, they have a white spot on each corner. So one on each corner of their tail feathers and one on the end of their wing. So when you see a bird in flight, you can very often tell the males well, quite easily from the females if the light levels are good enough because um, you can see these white flashes on the wings. Now, the males will use those white flashes as a signal to other males in particular that they're a male, this is their territory, this is their patch, and the other males need to clear off. Um, we've got some ducks coming in there. Um, and they will also, if that doesn't work, if that visual display doesn't um, doesn't work as a sort of deterrent to other males, they will also, oh, midges are right here. Um, they will also um, then clap their wings behind their back as a physical, audible deterrent to other males to show their strength and their fitness. Um, so that. There's a male cheering there. Right, let's head around that way because we might pick up this cheering around here. I'll get a bit of a march on for you because I want to try and, while the light's still this good, get at least get closer to a sound so it's very clear. 
So the males will have this physical, this this visible um, deterrent of the the white wing spots on the the wings and the tail feathers, but also this physical deterrent if that visual deterrent doesn't work uh, of physically clapping their wings behind their back, and then that acts as a, a show of strength, a display of strength to other males to let them know that they're they're serious when they're saying this is my patch, clear off. Um, I've never seen or never known it come to anything more than that. Um, I don't think they come to blows in any way, but um, they normally are pretty sensible and sort it out with visual cues or audible cues. Uh, and they will quickly... Oh, there's a bat on the wing. Hang on. Oh, and he's gone now. Typical. Just as I flip the camera around, it's always the way. Right, there is a nightjar chewing just over the crest here. So, apologies for this. I'm going to get a little march on. Let me flip the camera around. There he is, chewing off in the distance. Right, let's get a little wiggle on, guys. At least this moving is stopping the midges getting so concentrated on me. So apologies for this. If you just give me another minute or two... I'll get round and set and hopefully get close enough for you to clearly hear this call of a nightjar because the boys, the males are really starting to ramp up a bit now. And while we've got the light, there's every possibility I could catch one on the wing. So it's just gone a bit dark while I go underneath this oak tree. Should lighten up again now as I come out into the open. Oh, crikey, nearly took a tumble there. Putting life and limit risk here to bring night jars into your living room. Or wherever you may be. Uh, thought I heard night jar on the wing just now. Yeah, we've heard these cuit calls. Some of it, some of it might be the song thrushes that are singing in the background. Because I have heard them, what I think is mimicking... Um, the calls of night jars on the wing so their if you like breeding call is a, is a cheering call this constant sort of here we go i'll try and do an impression ready oh there's a night jar hang on look at that there you go that was a night jar on the wing. Oh, brilliant. Did you guys see that? Did I flip the camera around in time? Oh, there he goes again. Right, I'm a, I only get glimpses of this bird when it, when it goes above this tree line. If it stays below the tree line, you saw it, amazing, Kirsty. thank you so much. Oh, it was a woodcock call. Here he comes. There's your woodcock. What a bird. What a bird. Oh, it's a night jar. Oh, he's just... There you go. So this night jar, I can see him. He's just in this dead tree, just up there. Can you, can you see that dark? <laughs> it's difficult to describe. So that is a cheering night jar. That's the male. He's sat, he is right there. 
that's in there. It's very difficult to describe. It is a stunning call, an absolutely stunning call. And you will not hear anything else like this in the UK. Guys, thank you so much for everyone saying how lovely this is. Honest to God, it is my absolute pleasure. pleasure. It is a privilege to be able to bring moments like this to you. Let's just enjoy it for a minute. European night jar on the Surrey Heaths. I am sat on the floor. You can't you can't really see, can you? But I'm sat on the floor <laughs> getting eaten alive. Bringing bringing the new European night jar to uh, to you guys now. Fingers crossed that's just the start. I mean we're gonna have to go some to beat that, but I'm gonna give it a whirl. I'm gonna Alright, he's moved off and he's cheering off in the distance now. But that <laughs> That is a heck of a, a heck of a sighting. So I'm going to try and position myself. Oh, sorry, I'm being eaten alive. Being eaten alive. Uh, that is the European nightjar, ladies and gents. That is the cheering. That is a bird that sounds nothing like anything else in the UK. And for me is one of the reasons why I love Lowland Heathland in the UK. I'm a bit biased because I've, I've been managing it in the past. And he's cheering away off in the distance there. I'm just gonna plonk myself here a second. Let me just get the tripod set up. Just in case he comes back this way. Sorry, this is all a bit of a, this is all a bit of a wrestle. First night jar, Lou. There you go. Right, let's pop you guys in there so you stop feeling so seasick with my movement. Ah, oh, guys, well, honestly, absolute pleasure that I was able to bring you your first night jar, virtually at least. Now the world's so easy, so. Okay. So that night jar, uh, what's the best way to do it this way? There you go. So those Scots pine trees that you can see just in the distance here, these three taller ones, he is currently sat churring away in one of those. I think. It's it's in that direction anyway. And uh, they'll probably keep going. Well, in theory, they'll, they'll cheer all through the night if they need to. But they tend to be a bit more active vocally at dawn and dusk. Um, I've only ever gone out surveying for them at um, at dusk that's because I'm more of an evening person than I am a morning person any of my friends or colleagues watching that will I'm sure agree um, but I wouldn't be surprised if this bird gets back on the wing at some point now this cheering call that they're making like I said they will make when they're um, on a perch on a tree in this static they also have a second call, it's like kiwi, 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 which is more of a, again, an awful impression, but it's a contact call, it's a call that they only ever make when they're on the wing. So if we start hearing that, that's a, that's a bird that's on the wing, and I'll probably go quiet and try and find where that bird is so I can, so I can get it on the wing. We still have enough light, that means I might be able to get um, at least a good silhouette. 
of the bird, but can you still hear him chirping off in the distance? Please do do comment or give it a, a like or a, a heart or whatever you want to do to let me know that you can still hear this bird behind me. I'm hoping you can. Here we go. Right, stop cheering. Oh, and he started again. <laughs> Sometimes when they... Here we go. I'm just going to put a torch on my face. It might be too bright. Does that kind of work? There we go. Sort of. There we go. So, um... You can hear it, excellent. Now, oh, he's off. I'm going to turn the torch off a sec. Right, stop cheering. Right, so there's no cuic calls, there's no contact calls. You, you can hear it, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Now, with a lot of wildlife, you can hear the cheering, brilliant, 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 absolutely brilliant. And it, so many people have said it's, you know, it's a, it's a, a very distinctive call, it's magical. Um, there is nothing else like it in the UK. And, and, th and that's what I love about them. You know, I'm a, I'm a big, big advocate of, um, yeah, Lane, absolutely. We'll, we'll be having guided walks, I'm sure, hopefully really, really soon. Keep an eye on the website and things. In fact, I think I've got one coming up in the near future um, on Wisley Common on the other side of, side of the common. Um, if you want to come and try and experience this in the, in the, in the flesh, <laughs> you need a quieter computer. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is why I'm such an advocate of, um, of British wildlife, because it is such... Let's just get it. Oh, there we go such an advocate of British wildlife because people are constantly and rightly so fascinated by what we can find in the tropics or in Africa where there's elephants and lions um, and sometimes I feel like we overlook just how incredible British wildlife is now I say that when I'm talking about the nightjar which is a bird that spends half its time in sub-saharan Africa so it's not technically completely a British bird it breeds here um, but we do share it with our, with our, um, you know, our friends in, in sub-Saharan Africa and also the whole of Southern Europe and Northern Africa as they migrate to and from these two different seasonal grounds every year. Now, I naturally, like with all wildlife, heard him cheering over there. He's off again. And I want to go over that way to see if we can get a bit closer to the cheering. But as soon as I move from here and move over that way, my five pounds says he comes back here into that tree that we were just at. And he starts cheering over there. But we're gonna risk it and we'll give it a whirl. So this might be slightly Blair Witch. <laughs> Apologies for that. But here we go, you can get a bit of the sunset. I won't get too close because I don't want to disturb him. He's got far more important things to be doing than putting on too much of a show for us. However, in terms of bringing wildlife into your home, you can probably still hear him cheering. Here we go. Oh, there he goes, it's on the wing. just gone on the wing. I saw him leave the tree. But he's, he's dropped below the tree line. And now... So that's... Oh, you guys really can't see anything, can you, without a torch on my face? So, that's the beauty of these birds. When they're cheering, I know roughly where they are. But as soon as they leave that perch and they take to the wing and they drop below the tree line, they're gone. They're like shadows. They're absolutely silent on the wing like an owl. He's cheering again. He's back in a similar, very similar spot. Let me flip the camera around. 
So he's, he's somewhere in one of these sort of taller pine trees, or at least in that direction. And I'll just leave you for 30 seconds to take in that sound. Now, you'll probably be able to hear in that call, there's two slight pitches. There's a longer drawn out phrase like this, and then there's that little delay. So it's like they go No one really, Sue heard it described as a zombie raker. Yeah, it's something bizarre. No one's quite sure exactly what is causing that those two different pitches in sound one um uh idea is that it's the bird turning its head and our ears right he's stopped calling he might be on the wing now nah, just having a rest and who can blame him uh, so some people think it might be the bird turning its head and our eyes uh, sorry our eyes our ears our ears hear it as um two different pitches. However, the theory that I think makes the most sense to me anyway, is that the bird is making the sound while it exhales and inhales. And the difference in the short, the shorter pitch is when the bird goes <gasps> and carries on going. So just listen. So you can hear those differences hopefully. And I think that's when the bird is inhaling and then carries on cheering. And for me, like, I've got absolutely zero science to back this up. And there's probably people out there with PhDs and research journals that have looked into this way more than I have. But for me, this is one of the ways that the bird is demonstrating its fitness. How long it can keep cheering for is a marker to the females and to other males that, hey, look, I can keep the exhale going for a long old time and I can keep the whole cheering thing going for a long old time as well. And that is a marker of, of fitness for, for for my part anyway that's that's what I kind of think um, maybe there's a PhD in it for me and if I ever get the spare time to think about cramming in a PhD maybe that's something that, that I can consider equally if there's any academics out there watching this it'd be a fascinating study hey, right you stop calling again oh there's a wing clap He's through the trees, wing clapping. There you go. So I, I don't know. Oh, let's put the light back on me. I don't know whether you heard that, but you, you may have heard a few. Oh, David, you heard it. Amazing. Wing claps. Amazing. Sorry, I'm like a kid in the sweet shop here, but it's, it's just so phenomenal um, to uh, to be able to bring this to you guys. I mean, the, the wonders of modern technology, just phenomenal. Right. Let's just move up here a bit because he's moved off to another perch. Oh, forgot I've got to get the, the video in shot. We've still got over a hundred people watching this live stream right now. So thank you so, so much to everyone who, who has been watching. I know everyone's got busy lives and, you know, families and stuff going on, but hugely appreciative of everyone to take the time out of their evening to, uh, to experience this and allow me to bring a glimpse of British wildlife into your, into your homes, right? I can't really, can't really really see where I'm going at the minute because I've got a torch shining in my face <laughs> but there's another woodcock calling and the nightjar is still cheering we'll just move around here we'll have a listen here for five or ten minutes 
and then we'll think about winding this in. Right, I'll just pitch the uh, I'll just pitch the tripod up here. Bear with me a second. So he's gone way off over in the distance there. I'm not sure how much more we're going to pick up. I'll keep this rolling for another five minutes. And we are starting to lose the light, so this is going to become more of a audible experience than a visual one. Uh, need to check Headley Heath. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Headley's a good, a good site for them as well. Any of the heaths in Surrey, Dorset, the Sussex Fringes, Hampshire... Um, are really good for them. Yeah, woodcocks. Yeah, they have this really thin, high-pitched call, and they sound a bit like a, a bit like a pig um, squealing or like a squelch sound um, when they um, when they get bothered by something. Uh, never forget the call of night, Joe. Roger, an absolute pleasure. Pleasure, Matthew. Again, absolute pleasure. Thank you ever so much to everyone. There's a woodcock call. off in the distance there I will leave you guys with 30 seconds of a sunset over Surrey with the night jars cheering thank you ever so much to everyone who's joined this uh, this live stream so glad it's worked and technology's been our friend uh, so glad the night jars have performed as well which is brilliant and we've a really good weather for it keep an eye on Surrey Wildlife Trust website there'll be guided walks and things coming up in the near future I'm sure COVID uh, you know conditions permitting um, but if you want to know more, find out more about them, feel free to get in touch with Surrey Wildlife Trust or any of your local wildlife trusts will be more than happy to point you in the right direction where you can go and um, go and see these things. So I'll flip the camera around. We'll have another minute or so of, uh, of a sunset in Surrey with the night jars cheering in the background. If anything kicks off in that minute, I'll try and record it. And uh, hope everyone's well. Look after yourselves and hopefully see you on a nature reserve sometime soon.